hi guys, it's Sophie. So I'm going to be doing my November wrap up today. It's a bit late. Um, I explained in my last video, my December uh, TBR and kind of haul, um, that I was redoing my library. It is painted. You can't see much of where we are now, but it looks so nice. I'm so happy with it. I'm having a really lovely day. Like, all of the things. I'm just really happy. Nothing particularly special has happened. I'm just, re I'm just really loving today. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be chatting about what I've read in a month. I'm going to start with fiction, and then I've got some children's books, and then non-fiction, because non-fiction in November. So the first one I have to show you is The Clay Girl by Heather Tucker. Um, I was very kindly sent this um, by Acacia. I don't know if it was Christmas or my birthday. One of the two. Maybe when I was ill. We're very nice. We send things to one another. And Acacia's very lovely. She always sends me really interesting things. Um, she absolutely loved this. Um, and I sort of raved about it on her channel. And I saw it on her channel. And I saw it on Mercedes' channel. Um, and yeah, it's essentially a book about um, a strange... Uh, sort of family dynamic and this girl in the middle of it called Ari um, who grows up as Harriet but uh, doesn't kind of want to be part of the family anymore really and um, doesn't really identify with it um, and changes her name to Ari and uh, there's a lot of abuse that goes on um, so potential trigger warnings um, whilst it's not the focus, I wouldn't say, of the book it's more about her as an individual um, is quite central to why she can be the way she is. Um, so yeah, it's about this sort of unusual girl and um, an imaginary seahorse that she has called Jasper. Um, now, I had quite mixed feelings about this book, um, which I've actually got more positive having finished it. So I found the language quite difficult. Um, not that it was hard to understand, um, but it's very whimsical throughout. And I had thought when I started it that it was a factor of her being very young, um, but it does retain that throughout the book. And I didn't like it um, because personally for me, um, it made me recognise I was reading throughout. Um, so I was reading it and thinking, oh, I'm reading. And I don't like that. I prefer to um, be so fully immersed in the book, I kind of forget that I'm reading. Um, so that was a little bit annoying for me and, and I kind of, I think I owned an R, I think I gave it sort of three stars in the end but I have kept going back on my head to bits of this book after um, so I think oddly I enjoyed it more after reading it than I did reading it um, yeah there, there are a little, there are a few things in there that I thought um, from my personal experience were potentially unrealistic um, but there are some things in there that are really valuable and um, similar things um, to my absolute darling about kind of the strength of people um, despite their uh, sort of, you know, abusive backgrounds. Um, so yeah, I'm sure you've heard lots of things about this one already, so I'm not going to waffle on too much longer, but that's my two cents on it. I have some new tea today. It looks grim. <laughs> it's like grey, grey dishwater. Is it too hot still? Um, and it's Moroccan mint and cardamom. I don't like it. <laughs> I think it tastes a little bit like dishwater and maybe it will grow on me. Um, I did brew it for far longer than I was supposed to because I was on my phone and then I started taking selfies. <laughs> um, so yeah, maybe that's part of it. But I don't think I'm a fan of that one. Um, I tend not to like the twinings, like her one so much, but I got a huge pack of them last year for Christmas, so I'm trying to use them up um, at the moment. But I don't think that's what I'm going to go back to. Okay, so the next book I really liked. I read this for my In Real Life book club, um, and yeah, I I hadn't liked her first book, Barrow Wright, so much, but The Good People by Hannah Kent, I loved. I, I read it not in one sort of frantic sitting, but pretty much in two. <laughs> um, it's a story about a group of women in like, is it 18, yeah, 1825 um, in Ireland, very rural Ireland, who are dealing um, with a child that they believe may be a changeling. Um, and it's all about the relationship um, between sort of uh, modern uh, trends and, and thinking and um, I guess kind of folk belief versus religious belief. Um, and, and, you know, it's a lot about grief as well, um, talking about the things that we can accept and the things we can't accept. Um, but the thing I really enjoyed about this book was the atmosphere. I felt as though the setting was 
incredibly vivid. I felt as though I was there. Um, I was with the characters throughout um, and I uh, sort of found that they were able to affect me quite a lot when I was reading it, that I could kind of identify with pieces and um, felt strongly sort of to and from. And to be honest, historical novels normally don't have that so much for me. Um, I read a lot of contemporary, I don't tend to go for historical, but I really liked it. Um, yeah, and I'm glad I waited because I'm not great with height stuff sometimes, um, but actually I really enjoyed it as itself, and it's like, what, like a year on from when it's published? So yeah, if you haven't read it, if you're like me, um, it is really good. It's actually genuinely really good. <laughs> so go and pick it up. And the next one was another really good one. It's just on a roll. Um, and this was A Jest of God by Margaret Lawrence. And I bought this in the summer um, at like a bookshop that I used to shop at when I was a really little girl. Um, and I thought that it was just absolutely stunning. I mean, I, I still do. Um, and the inside's got the same picture. It's just really nicely published. It's by Apollo. Um, they do uh, sort of recovered classics that are less popular and sort of put them together and bring them to life. Um, this is a book that is at its heart about loneliness and about relationships and also about the pressures on women. Um, it is, you know, a classic, so it is a little bit outdated in terms of the ways that women are perceived, but I actually thought that it was still really relevant to a lot of the things that I feel in my life. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's about this um, woman who's in her early 30s who's very much kind of cut off from society because she cares for her invalid mother. Um, she's never had a relationship, she's a virgin, um, and yeah, she doesn't really have any friends, she doesn't really have any anyone that she knows, um, and she's just kind of accepting that she's probably going to be a spinster, really. Um, and this story is about her falling in love for the first time, and it's just, it's so good. I, I read it and it was one of, the, one of the few books I've had this year that I wanted to just read again immediately. Um, yeah, like there were some bits of it that were just, I don't know, just really relatable. Um, and some bits that were really funny, some, I don't know, I just really liked it. Um, I, I'm definitely going to out more of the things that she's written. She has written um, a few others as well. Um, there's the Fire Dwellers, A Bird in the House, and The Stone Angel, um, none of which I've read. So yeah, she's she's someone I'm going to be kind of looking more into. I really like unlikable female characters, or unusual female characters, or unstereotypical female characters um, when I'm reading. So yeah, 2019, I'm going to find myself some more of her. And the last fiction was a slog, <laughs> and I can't pretend I loved it as much as the other ones, but it was 4321 by Paul Oster. Now, I've been reading this for, literally, for forever. It feels like it's been forever. Um, it's it's big, it's chunky, but I started out really, really excited. I pre-ordered it, and I think it was probably one, if not, like one of maybe two or three, if not the only book that I pre-ordered the whole of 2017. So I was really excited for it. Um, and it's kind of a bit sadly, it's not your fault, I promise. But there were quite a lot of comments saying it was really hard to follow and that you needed to take notes throughout and that um, it, it just felt difficult before I'd even started. I started it, I got kind of like 100 pages in and I kept putting it down and I was reading it in like spurts. Eventually I got through an audio book um, and I didn't love it. <laughs> I'm glad I finished it because I kind of committed to it. Um, but yeah, it, the book itself is clever. So it is uh, four, st four stories that happen simultaneously of uh, one individual who is called Ferguson. Um, and these are parallel lives, essentially. Um, so it's what would be different if you did X in your life or Y in your life and how would the people that you think are important in your life in this way, um, how would they appear to you if you're in a completely different scenario, uh, what parts of you are unchangeable and which parts uh, will remain. Um, so I like that, I like that as a kind of idea, but I didn't like Ferguson, <laughs> which is a problem when it's like a 900 page book and I've got to read four of him. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I don't know, I didn't really get on with him. I thought it was interesting in that um, the book was really more about history and life than about him but his voice just irritated me, so I, I found it really, really hard work. Um, there's also a character called Amy in here, if you've read it, I was just like, can we either, right, can we marry Amy, or can we have her die in some horrendous accent? Because I was so bored of Amy as well. So, so realistically, when you have like a 900 page book and you don't like either of the two main characters, it's probably not gonna be my favorite kind of book. 
Ah, the idea just didn't like them. <laughs> so that's it for fiction. I've got a couple of picture books to show you. This one I've shown in my November favourite. This is Hortense and Shadow uh, by Natalia and Lauren O'Hara. Um, and it is just an absolutely stunning picture book. Um, I love the illustrations, I love the style, I really like the language as well, um, I really highly recommend this one. Um, it's a story about a little girl who hates her shadow and wants to get rid of it. And the next one I got was a book that was another children's book that was illustrated by John Classen. Now I really like um, his work, I really like his style. Um, this one is called The Wolf, the Duck and the Mouse. Um, and again it's beautiful, the book itself is beautiful, um, unfortunately I didn't love the story as much as I've loved some of the others. The others have made me laugh out loud like as an adult um, and this didn't do that for me. I still think it's sweet, like it's probably more for children than adults <laughs> obviously but I think some of his other stuff you could read and equally well enjoy as an adult. This one I didn't feel applied so much. If a cat burns her face on the candle I do apologise. <laughs> she doesn't know you don't get into it. Like she wants to put her nose in the candle and I smell it and I'm like, babe, I understand, <laughs> but you have to stop. Um, actually, whilst we're on cats, we're going to get started on the non-fiction. Um, the first non-fiction I have is How to Live Like Your Cat. And no, I'm not going to stick my nose into my candle. Um, yeah, this is by Stephanie Garnier and this is translated from French, she says. I think it's French. Yeah, translated from French. Uh, who by? Bye. Roland Glasser um, and these are, it's kind of like a self-helpy type thing, um, talking about the traits that cats have that people could do with a little bit more of. Um, I didn't I didn't like it, um, <laughs> partly because I was reading it and I was like, my cat, no, you've never met my cat, my cat would never do that. Like, as we're speaking, she's destroying my bookshelf, he's like, she, the cats are the epitome of calm, I'm like, no. Um, but yeah, I, I just... I don't know, I felt as though it repeated itself a lot um, and it just kind of felt like it could have been just been summed up like chill, <laughs> like open the book, like lie, lie down, be comfy. Um, yeah, also cats are arseholes so you know, I feel like there should have been more about like how being an arsehole can be good. And the next one I read um, was A First Rate Madness uh, by Nasia Gahami and this is a book talking about how mental illness and leadership traits can interact, uh, whether or not neurotypical leaders, people without any mental health issues um, are better or worse um, or no different to people with mental illness. And kind of the discussion is that there are certain things you can learn, certain skills um, through having mental illness and coping and dealing with that that can be useful in the context of leadership. Um, yeah, I thought it was fairly interesting. Um, it was good to have like a positive uh, sort of take I guess on the things that you do learn when you're mentally ill um, and you know that that was something that I found really interesting um, but it was very American centric I didn't know a lot about the leaders it was speaking about and I think I lost a bit because of that because of my history for those individuals wasn't really there yeah there were some in there that obviously I did know like Hitler <laughs> Um, like Martin Luther King and Winston Churchill but there were some leaders like Sherman General Sherman who I just never had heard of before um, and he just seemed like a bit of a dick so yeah um, it was interesting though and it's definitely something different like I've got another book in here that's about mental health I might skip forward to that one um, just so I can kind of compare how lots of non-fiction talks about mental illness this is the other one this is the other non-fiction book about mental illness I read this month I want to shred this book I don't I'm not bad to books I'm not mean to books but I really hated this book I like hate read it and I knew I was going to hate it, that's kind of why I got it. Um, but it was just the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Like, he's going through and talk, just for an example, um, about how kind of faulty the reasoning was in here. So he was talking about studies that are saying that people who come into mental hospital, um, who are having a psychotic episode, um, sometimes can be given medication to help them, sometimes will not be given any medication. And he was saying that those who are given medication, oh, they are more unwell and oh, they end up being psychotic again in future. And it's kind of like, right, like, this was not a random trial. It wasn't that half the people who came into the hospital were just not bothered get, given anything or given placebos. 
those who needed medication were treated with medication and, unsurprisingly, they're probably those who needed medication. And people who have psychosis, if they go off their medication, quite often become psychotic again. So it was just like, I just wanted to shake him. I, there are some elements in here that I'm like, yeah, agreed. There are some things where I'm just like, what is wrong with you? So, for example, um, I think that we do like um, over prescribe certain medications to people um, if they've had things for, for quite a short period of time. But I think that's mostly the fault of um, overworked GP rather than anything else. Um, because it, you know it, it, waiting lists for therapy and, and things um, are much longer than, than the time it's going to take to prescribe someone a course of antidepressants and, and give that a try. Um, so I do understand that element of this discussion but the rest of it was bullshit um, and just really harmful um, basically saying that no medication does anything, um, that it's just like taking like a heroin, um, you're just changing your state of mind, it's never going to heal you and it's like well actually sometimes medication isn't meant to heal you, it's meant to help regulate something. You don't take insulin expecting that you're not going to be diabetic anymore, you need to keep taking the insulin. Now I'm going to stop because I feel like I'm probably just preaching to the choir here, um, but yeah in terms of this book don't, don't bother, um, I've done it for you and you don't need to read it. Um, yeah, it's it's garbage. The next one I have, I didn't hate, so that's good. Um, and this one is Ethics in the Real World by Peter Singer. Um, these are tiny little essays on a whole range of little ethical issues. Um, anything you can imagine really, treatment of animals, um, like global warming, um, euthanasia, whatever. Whole different range, all like a couple pages long. Um, and for me it was just quite an interesting exercise to kind of consider um, how my own views in terms of my ethics fit in with um, Peter Singer's who is like a very famous um, utilitarian which is what I mostly identify with in terms of how I make ethical decisions um, but there are certain lines that he drew one, at one place and I drew it in a different place um, but yeah I am still very much just dipping my toes into the ethical the ethical world um, and, and reading more about it um, but yeah I, I think there's a lot to be found in here and um, if you don't know how you identify in terms of how you make ethical decisions um, these are quite a nice taster to the, the ways in which you can apply uh, utilitarian ideals. And the next one I have is Tell Me How It Ends that's very white, um, by Valeria Luisilla, and this is an essay in 40 questions. Um, it is literally just a single essay talking about um, the experience that uh, refugees have when entering the United States, um, and the questions that they are asked as uh, immigrants, and um, how that experience, what that experience is like for them. So, so the author used to work as um, a translator so she would sit and listen to these children telling stories and um, she's writing a lot about how there are certain buzzwords that kind of get you into the states and if you don't hit enough criteria you are sent back, you are just deported, um, they, you would be chopped over the border and deal with it there. Um, so, so they're kind of listening to these, these, these children telling these stories, um, hoping to hear that um, if they go home they will be killed because that means they don't have to be just thrown over the border. So it's it's a really odd idea. Um, I cried this, um, there was one section in this book that just properly made me cry and it, it was describing how there were these two sisters who'd been sent um, on the Bestia, which is um, this train where, it's just an incredibly dangerous train, it kind of runs through Central America and um, Lots of people who are, who are trying to get to the States use it uh, to get sort of further on their journey but um, there's ridiculously high rates of rape and abuse and, and theft. Um, so these two little girls have been sent off on this really dangerous journey um, to try and find their mother who was in the United States and to go and settle and live with her. And their grandmother had sewed a number into the back of their dresses and told them no matter where you are, no matter what happens to you, um, you will never take these dresses off and it doesn't matter what situation you're in, they stay on. Um, and she said when you get to the other side you need to go and find a border control agent 
and tell them, and hand yourself in to go and find them and tell them to look at the number on the back of your dress and if they ring it they'll find your mother because these little girls couldn't remember the phone number um, to call their mum when they got there and without it they would never be able to find her and like even now like, <laughs> like it, it, it was just such a um, singular example of that experience and I think when you're reading non-fiction about really difficult issues um, it's really important to have those tiny pieces that hit you so hard and make it feel really real um, because it's easy to read it and be like oh yeah everything is terrible and ooh 83% of people but when you actually think about it as an individual that's that's often how it um, makes a kind of really strong impact so yeah I really like this one if you're interested in the topic do have a read another book on ethics um, this one is Strangers Drowning by Larissa McQuaffa. Uh, this is talking about extreme um, sort of altruism and I really like this book. I natted on about it um, to my mum and to anyone who listened sort of when I was reading it. Um, things like a couple who adopt like 23 children, um, someone who like gives up his medical practice to go and start a leprosy colony, all sorts of things. Um, so all of these examples of people doing really extraordinary activities for people normally that they don't know. I think the thing that I enjoyed so much about this is because of the way I, th I think about um, ethics and the way that I decide what's right and wrong, um, these people are taking what I believe, like, um, they're, they're putting that above everything else and I really respect it because uh, I'm not someone who reads this and thinks, oh my god, they're completely mad. I'm like, yeah, I completely understand. That is the right thing to do, but I'm too selfish, or I like things too much, or whatever, and I don't do that. Um, so, yeah, it was just, it was really, really hopeful in a way um, to be reading it. It's made me think a lot more about the way that I do interact, and if there is more that I can do sort of within my means. Um, it talks a lot about effective altruism as well, which is something that's really interesting if you haven't heard of it before. It's it's basically um, sort of encouraging people to give what they can, but to give it in a way that is uh, has the best impact. So uh, often people who donate to charity or do things um, do do sort of that. You know, they get they do charitable activities, volunteer, etc. Will do it to something that's very close to them. Um, you might go in volunteer at your local cat shelter or um, I don't know if, if your parent has has had um, a certain illness you might decide to uh, do some activist work for that charity for example that might help do research for that illness so, so often we choose causes that are close to us or causes that we can kind of identify with and, and go with but if you're thinking about it quite coldly often that doesn't have the biggest impact for what you could do um, if you have, say, £100 and you're spending it in your local, um, you know, whatever, your local cat shelter, maybe you could save the lives of four cats, let's say, um, and, and obviously that's great, um, but when, like, polio vaccinations are, like, 30p and that will save the life of a child, comparatively, your time and your money will be better spent on the polio, even though you'll never see the outcome of that. So it's talking a lot about how that's hard um, and it goes against what you feel because you can't see it, um, but how actually it can have a bigger impact. And just a brief aside, this is a long old video. When I was thinking about what charity to use for my around the world, I went on GiveWell, which is um, an effective altruism site, because I wanted to, to, to do it in that way. Um, but the charities that are the most effective aren't ones that I felt would do well on booktube, which is part of the reason why World Literacy um, stood out to me. I do think the literacy is a really, a really huge issue and I think it's a you know, brilliant cause and it fits very nicely with the challenge. Um, and you know, I, I think it appeals to lots of people here and actually I thought it would probably do better. But I think about things in terms of that effective altruism um, and my weighing up in my head was in this area world literacy will do better people will be more willing to donate to that kind of a charity than say mosquito nets um because of the link um, because lots of people are readers here so so yeah i think it's a really interesting topic i've been talking about this to everyone i don't know why it took me so long to read it if you're interested in effective altruism if you're interested in extreme altruism um have a read um whilst we're here go donate blood <laughs> 
you know, all the things, fine, let's donate bone marrow. These are things that are little things, at least, even if it's not the great big things, um, and it will help make a difference. Lecture over. Okay, the next one is something completely different. Um, this is The Red Parts by Maggie Nelson. Uh, this is so subtitled um, The Autobiography of a Trial. Uh, this is a story about Maggie Nelson's aunt who was murdered um, and about um, the, her sort of attending the trial at which the man who killed her is brought to justice um, and the emotions and the effect on her family and how it affected the entire family. Um, and I really did like it, it's a really interesting way to talk about that kind of a subject and I think she did say very well. Um, but as I mentioned when I hauled it, the reason this appealed to me particularly is because I've actually had a really similar experience in my own family. Um, it wasn't my aunt, it was my great aunt um, who was murdered. Um, and whilst we didn't know who did it, um, fairly swiftly after, it, it does change like our whole family. A murder is a very different thing um, to a death of any other kind really. Um, and it affects people very strongly, especially those closest to the person who has been murdered. Um, and I had a really interesting conversation with my mum, because uh, it was on my mum's side, about the murder and how it affected the family, sort of following on from this. Um, so it was just, it was a, I think it opened up that communication between me and my mum about it, um, because it's not something that we talk about an awful lot um, in my family, it was something that we um, tried to make light of quite quickly, uh, that was kind of our way of dealing with it. Um, but yeah, so I had kind of one of my first serious conversations about it with my mum following reading this, um, which was really valuable for me. My camera's flashing, I've still got four books to go. Whew, it's because I've been filming for a half an hour, just too chatty today. But yeah, The Muslims Are Coming <laughs> by Arun Kandani. Um, this is a book about um, Islamophobia and about extremism and about how to deal with Islamists. It's a weird book, but it's really interesting. Um, and I this this is a book for people who are already um, feeling that um, they they aren't Islamophobic. Okay, so if uh, if this is someone who's wanting to just explore um, the the kind of big ideas around um, Islam, this probably isn't the book for you. This is a book that is for people who've already read quite a lot, I think, about um, about you know Islamophobia, about Islamism, um, and about the different ways in which people try and explain and talk about Islamism. Um, and it's kind of exploring the faults and flaws in lots of different ways that it's viewed. I cursed it, I said it was gonna die, and my card filled up and then my battery died. I'm gonna go. I play on my cross. I say I'm going to go and I immediately go into a tangent. I was playing Animal Crossing on my little break. I'm loving it. The the one on the mobile. If you want to add me, I'll put my thing down below. Um, I used to love playing it and all the nostalgia. I'm already addicted. I've only had it for a couple of days. But yeah, if you want to add me and be a friend and send me shit or whatever it is, kudos. That's the thing. Um, well, we can do that. <laughs> so I was midway through talking about the Muslims are coming. Um, so yeah, it is more talking about like the ideas of who decides what extreme is and how do we, who who is the arbiter of this morality and who decides what a religion is. Um, it's really, it's really interesting but it's not a beginner's book. Um, yeah, I learned an awful lot from it and it challenged quite a few of my ideas um, and yeah, I, I it made things more complicated than I thought they were, which is probably good because it probably means I have a bit of a better understanding than I did before. The next book I found really hard to classify, um, but I'm going with non-fiction, and this one is The White Book by Han Kang. Now, you could use this as like almost like poetry or memoir. Um, it, yeah, it's just beautiful. So it's kind of musings on the colour white, a little bit like Bluette, but this one follows more of a storyline um, and the main kind of storyline in this is um, the death of her infant sister who was born prematurely to her mum who was completely isolated and uh, unable to get to hospital and that scenario. Um, it's really beautifully written, it was really sad, um, I just found it really touching. I, I think I gave it five stars in the end. It wasn't really what I was expecting. Um, it feels like an art project, 
um, feels art like art rather than like anything else. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I think it's definitely different to her other work and if you're interested in it, have a go. Um, it's been a long time since I've read something that was so different um, to kind of anything else that I've read before. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just interesting and, and strange and beautiful. Like it's really beautiful, it's really overwhelmingly beautiful. So yeah, there's a white book. And the next one I read was really sad. And it is The Year of Magical Thinking, which is just completely white, there you go, by Joan Didion. It's a book about grief. Um, this is a book about the death of uh, someone very close to you. Um, in this case, her husband um, and her daughter. This one focuses on her husband. And it's all about the sudden sort of reality of death and how it changes your life kind of in an instant. Um, and about the ways in which you try and um, hold back this loss. Now, I'm lucky to have not have lost people like in my close family. Um, and I, in no way am I kind of belittling the experience of grief for anyone who's going through that. Um, but part of BPD is that um, you have a really strong fear of abandonment and loss and often loss for BPD people is compared um, sort of to a grief experience um, for a neurotypical person. Now I've, as I say, I've never had anyone close to me who has passed away and I really don't mean to have any offence by this but I found that I could relate to quite a lot of um, the experiences in this book from my own uh, breakdown or loss of people in my life whilst they are still alive who I will no longer be able to contact. Um, things like uh, pretending, um, well not pretending but kind of uh, keeping hold of some sense that they will come back. Um, so she describes um, how she went through the stage of throwing away her husband's clothes and she couldn't get rid of his shoes because if he came back, when he came back, he'd need his shoes. and. Um, there are aspects of that that I relate to really strongly in my own life. So yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I think this is probably my favourite Joan Didion. This is a lot of people's favourites, Joan, Joan Didion. Um, but yeah, I, I really recommend it. And then the last book I have for this month, My Camera's Now Died Twice, <laughs> um, is I Can't Breathe by Matt Tabahy. No one has corrected me yet, and I've said it like a hundred different ways. Um, this is a book about the life um, of Eric Garner and his death and the court case and the implications of his death. Um, for those of you who um, sort of don't remember his name or didn't ever hear about it, um, he is the man who was put in chokehold by the police for selling single cigarettes and was choked to death. Um, and yeah, it, I understand there's a lot of really problematic things about the author and I probably won't be buying anything else that he puts out. Um, but the thing I really did like about this book is it's an exploration of um, Eric Garner's life and the life of his family. It's not just his death, um, it talks about him as a person and I got a real sense of him as an individual. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a bit strange, I guess, kind of reading about um, like Black Lives Matter, essentially in kind of the, the beginning of that, um, through a white journalist's lens. A lot of what I've read has been um, through black writers. Um, but I actually, I think what was good about this bit was the fact that it did focus on his life um, and not just his death. So yeah, that's the last book I read this month. As I say, I probably won't be picking up more of his stuff in future, um, but I did quite enjoy it. I had a good month, um, I read an awful lot, I think it's like 17 or 18 books that I read. I'm going to have to try and pick them all up in a minute to do a thumbnail. <laughs> um, but yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed hearing me natter on about what I've read this month. Let me know in the comments down below, um, what was your favourite book you read this month, are there any of these that you're really interested in? Um, yeah, have you enjoyed this really long video because it must nearly be 40 minutes now that I've been filming. I'm going to struggle to get it below like 30, I would have thought with editing, she says. <laughs> that's probably like so much of me just nattering, but I think I might keep it in, I've had a really nice day and I'm feeling really chatty so yeah, I'll see you guys soon in my next video and look after yourselves until then, bye!